some good ones. Uh, All right. So someone asks, um, how do we know that it's possible to, not possible to have a different set of constants necessary for life? You see on Earth, um, you know, life on Earth has adapted to the, mm -hmm. the conditions that it has, uh, water okay. life, uh, right. land life. How, how could, what if uh, constants had changed a little bit so that life would adapt to those? Right, so that's, that's a question that's been asked. Actually, there's an article at, on Forbes magazine about a week ago and talking about, well, maybe we were just wrong about the narrowness of these constants. Maybe we just don't know how much more flexibility we could have and still arrive at the same location. Well, that may be true of the locational constants, but it's not true of the foundational constants because we know that small changes in weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, electromagnetism, those kinds of things would not even allow a universe to sustain itself so that life could emerge. When people say, well, maybe there, there's more flexibility, what they're really talking about are the uh, conditions of planet Earth, of planet Earth. Mm -hmm. So we already know that the fine-tuning of the foundational constants of physics, you're not going to be able to get away from that. But you could argue, well, look, how do we know that if the, if the Earth's crust was just a, a, you know, half a mile thicker or the moon was a little bit smaller or a little bit further away, how do we know that life wouldn't still emerge? Okay, fine. Uh, you'll notice that my card dealing here had nothing to do with the conditions of the Earth. They were all just about the foundational conditions of physics in general at the foundational level that are preposterously large. So even if you were to say, well, I could fudge with this a little bit locationally here on Earth, you still got a problem in terms of the location of the galaxy and location and the conditions of the universe. Which is why, by the way, it's not as though I'm the only one, it's not as though I'm saying to you, as a Christian, I think the universe is fine-tuned or appears to be. No, everyone thinks that. Everyone thinks, even the atheist thinks there appears to be fine-tuning. He, he doesn't think it is fine-tuned. And that's why we have theories like multiverse theory. Because they see the same problem I see. The only difference is an explanation. Make sense? Let me show you what else they'll do sometimes. Sometimes they'll say this. They'll say, is it even necessary at all? Maybe the conditions like you're talking about for life are much broader. Or maybe you have a too narrow vision of what you call life. So Victor Stinger is now gone. He's, he died a couple of years ago. But he wrote a book called The Fallacy of Fine-Tuning. And here's what he said. To defeat the fine-tuning argument, I do not have to give a reason why each parameter has the value it does. I must only show that life could be plausible under a wide range of parameters. And that's kind of what you're asking here. Really? So, Victor, what would you call life? Remember I told you that one of the things that the defense attorneys will do is try to redefine terms? Here what he's trying to say is, I can redefine this word, uh, life, so that the parameters could be changed. I'm talking about organisms that can ingest, can metabolize, and can reproduce. Those are the very smallest conditions of things we would say, you're a living organism if you can do these things. That's pretty minimal, right? So here's what he says about life. He says, well, that's, he, just, he rejects this view of life because he knows that if he moves the parameters just a little bit, you won't get this. You won't get this at all. He knows that. So he redefines the word life. He says it this way. He says, in my view, life is a property that any sufficiently complex, non-linear, interacting, dissipative system will develop in a sufficiently long time. So I ignore, I will ignore those parameters that constrain life to our biology and our biology alone. He's redefined what life is. Any complex, nonlinear, interacting, dissipative system, I'm not sure what you mean by dissipative. Would a computer qualify then? Would a robot qualify? I mean, we could change the definitions and then say, well, the parameters can change. That's one way to do it. Can you imagine if I did that back at the crime scene? I said, you know, I'm just going to go, you want me to investigate this gas smell and, and these... Mo what am I here to investigate? I'm here to investigate this, right? If it was just the injury of a person, I wouldn't have to be called to the scene. It's the, I have to have a strong definition of what death is. 
So what they're doing is saying, hey, what are you here to do in this environment? Are you here just to explain any version of life you can think up? Or are you here to explain the version of life that's sitting in the room right now waiting for an explanation? So I don't think you can redefine it. And what they'll typically do, he, he's, he's got some imaginary form of life. Well, what is that? So I think when you're stuck with these parameters, um, and then again, remember that all I'm talking about are the parameters of the universe. You're going to have a hard time getting around those. If you wanted to argue, well, the earth could be a little bit bigger in mass, okay, fine. Remember, and it's, it, the mass of the earth alone is not going to solve your problem. It's that combination of mass, gravitational pull, distance from the sun in that Goldilocks zone, the thickness of the atmosphere, how much it allows oxygen and carbon-based life. To, it's a ton of these things that all have to be in place simultaneously before anything emerges, which is why there's a thing called the Fermi paradox. I think he was an astrophysicist who simply asked this question. Look, if the universe is infinitely old or it's really, really, really old and there's this many life forms out there, why haven't they found us yet? He's asking this of other atheist cosmologists and it's become called now, it's called the Fermi paradox. Why haven't they? Well, a guy named Drake wrote an equation in which he's got like seven things that have to happen in order for us to encounter intelligent life in the universe. And if you look at those seven things, there's a good reason to believe that there is no other intelligent life in the universe. Although people ask me all the time, what if there was? Would that change the Christian story? What if there's a planet out there where like Romulans are living, right? <laughs> and Klingons are on another planet, right? Right? Well, if you go to those planets, if those actually existed, I suspect when you get there, they're going to tell you a story about God coming to them in human form and dying to save them. Would that change your belief? If there's, if there's other life out here that God has... Look, He's clearly not just designed us. There's other biological life here on the planet with us. But He's got a special role for us. And that's not going to change if I find microbes on Mars. Hmm. It's not. It has no impact on my Christian worldview. It has no impact on the Christian story. 